my name is Laura and this is Aeroclass Expert Talks. Air cargo is without a doubt a crucial part of the global economic development and creates millions of jobs around the world. Thanks to air cargo, we are able to get food, vaccines, other medical supplies, electronics, flowers, jewelry, livestock, so many things without which our life would certainly be a little bit different. And it's definitely fair to say that without air cargo, a global supply chain would suffer. So let's talk about it. Let's discuss how important is air cargo and what the future holds for this industry. But before that, let me introduce you to my guest today. It is Aeroclass instructor, general manager at Aeroconcept, James Wyatt. So James, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. My pleasure, Laura, nice to be here. So as I said, we're going to speak about air cargo, but we're also going to give an opportunity for James to tell us how he got into aviation and what kind of experiences he had. So the floor is yours, James. Tell us and tell me, how did aviation become a per part of your life? Aviation became a part of my life from a very, very young age. Um, it, was a, it was an interest and a, and a hobby long before it became a career, I would say. Um, and I was uh, together with my parents on a Sunday afternoon. Very often you would find me at the, at the airport um, in the local area where I lived in the, uh, in the United Kingdom at this time, standing with my fingers through the fence of the, of the airport, looking beyond and seeing all these aircraft moving around, taking off and landing. And, thinking, how is this all, all possible? And just simply, I think the word I would use is probably just fascination, the fascination of, of flying. I gave a talk on this a few weeks ago and, it, and, it, and the word really is fascination and, and how the mechanics and everything works behind, behind aviation. Um, and then the whole air cargo piece started um, in, in 2001, where I was lucky enough um, to be hired by Lufthansa Cargo uh, in the UK, um, it, the, the, well, one of the biggest cargo airports in the United Kingdom still to this day called East Midlands Airport. Um, and Lufthansa Cargo had an operation there, both on the commercial and operational sides of the business. And I started in a, in a more commercial, let's say, yeah, customer service slash sales role. Um, started off by taking cargo bookings from the main cargo customers across the UK and Ireland. It also included various operational planning pieces, whether that was the planning of, of loads on, on trucks and, uh, and aircraft. Um, and then progressed from there um, to the team leader of the department after, after just a few months. And then in 2004, was given the opportunity um, to take over the responsibility for aircraft handling in the UK and Ireland, we had a, a 15 flight a week operation with the MD-11 aircraft um, on behalf uh, of DHL Express actually at this time. So we were operating the aircraft um, for and on behalf of them to and from the United States back through the UK into Germany. So crossing over 15 times a week. And this was where I guess really the whole core operational experience really came into play, was put into the Lufthansa Cargo Training Academy where you learned all the, um, all the areas of aircraft handling, weight of balance, ramp handling, dangerous goods, security, all of the special commodities, live animals, perishables and everything. So that was the real first core exposure, I would say. And when, and when travel really started, part of the training was also to go and visit other, other locations across the network to do the practical training. So physically handling the aircraft, physically handling cargo in a warehouse, um, so I was very lucky. I had the chance to go to Cologne and uh, to to Johannesburg within the first uh, within the first year. So, um, so that was good. And then progressed various projects uh, within the Lufthansa Cargo Group, um, including Jade Cargo, which was a seven four seven operation uh, based out of Shenzhen. And I was I was responsible in Europe for the for the emergency and security procedure side of it. And then in two thousand and eight was was. Uh, delighted to be given the opportunity to move to Germany as part of the startup team for, for Aerologic. And I was the uh, deputy post holder for ground operations. So a brand new airline um, jointly owned by Lufthansa Cargo and DHL Express. So a new airline was born um, and, and a fantastic team of people in a, in a, in a very uh, lively environment in Leipzig 
um, you know, starting a new airline was, was, was certainly the highlight of my career to date. Um, and then I went uh, to the Middle East. I had uh, just under a year for Qatar Airways Cargo, running their freight operations worldwide before coming back to Europe and working for DHL Express, uh, being responsible for the restricted commodities within their global network. So dangerous goods, live animals, perishables, all of the, let's say, special cargo within the, within the, uh, within the group. And then I went to the International Air Transport Association, had two years running the dangerous goods product portfolio, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, again, with lots of travel and um, then came back to Germany at the end of uh, 2018 and set up my little consulting empire enterprise as of um, the middle of uh, 2019. So 1st of May 2019. So I've just gone past three years of uh, a very interesting time, obviously, with the pandemic and also with the current uh, Ukraine crisis affecting our wonderful industry. Yeah. and. As I understand, so uh, it's been more than 20 years now kind of working in air cargo or anything kind of relating to that. Uh, and you just mentioned about your own company. So is that the most challenging time that you've had, you know, in your career? Or has there been anything else that really stood out for you as something really difficult, but maybe at the same time rewarding? Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of things I would mention. I think I think you're right. I think definitely the last the last three years have definitely been been a challenge. Of course, when you you know you leave big corporate organisations and you set up your own independent company, um, and I work together with a lot of uh, a lot of freelancers who also work under my brand from time to time. Um, obviously, when the pandemic hit, that was a huge huge challenge for for smaller more independent consulting companies as well as as well as the big ones out there to be able to survive because what happens in a crisis in terms of cost cutting is organizations immediately look to cut the ex external costs as far as they can and the traditional consultant as i would say is you know is definitely um, you know one of those areas so attention quickly turned to how to survive uh, you know how to survive the company and um, I was very lucky at the start of, uh, of the company. I had uh, some some great and still do have um, you know some fantastic customers. Lufthansa Cargo included uh, developed a management training program for them, uh, which we launched just prior to the pandemic, which we're hoping to start again shortly. Um, so it was yeah, there was a lot of media work. There was a lot of investment into collaborative partnerships, which were perhaps not um, yeah, financially. Um, at, at the same levels, but more of a time investment for more medium to long term rewards. Um, and so, yeah, continued to grow my already very large network, uh, kept in regular contact with people. And I think it was that real challenge of, of the daily routine of, you know, getting up at the same time, doing the sport, sitting in front of the computer and, and having that that consistent mentality to to keep going which when you work on your own a lot you know is quite is quite a challenge and obviously then the whole virtual world and everything came so that was definitely a challenge i think professionally the most exciting challenge was definitely the start of, of aerologic um so obviously from a security perspective you know you you are employed and and everything is okay so that was different you know to my own company time but the challenge of, of setting up a new airline across so many different levels, it was, was absolutely fascinating. So, you know, first of all, the learning, and I was responsible for the grand handling at all stations worldwide within our network. So going to all of the airports across the world, contracting services, um, bringing the aircraft in, um, you know, for the first flight, doing all the safety and security auditing, quality auditing. Um, and, and really starting the operation. And that was a challenge because even though we were backed by Lufthansa Cargo and DHL Express and were able to utilize, you know, certain aspects of their infrastructure globally, um, we were still an independent company. So having that set up within quite a short amount of time, um, you know, in, in a lot of different cultures across the world, you know, is, is definitely a challenge. But we had a, we had a fantastic team um, it really was seven days a week. I, I, I will be honest, you know, for for the first two to three years, but but the energy and and the effort and and the reward, I would say, it was it was the most challenging, but probably the most rewarding. There was nothing better than seeing a 
an aircraft come into a new location for the first time and, and be handled safely within time and um, you know departing again and, and um, you know with a good quality of service so yeah different challenges across I would say all the roles I've had have been have been challenging in, in one way or another. And you just mentioned uh, a fantastic team you said so if you reflect on your own experiences what do you think are the most important characteristics for someone working in aviation especially you know for someone who wants to succeed and who wants to just basically do well yeah interesting interesting question i think i think if you were to study for example transport and logistics management um and i i lecture at a couple of universities um on this on this topic and and one of the things we always say is that air cargo is not something that you would generally choose to go into um, you know, if you want, if you wanted to go into aviation, why would you go into air cargo? Why would you not perhaps go into the more glamorous side, which is perhaps on the passenger side of the business, you know, and so on? But um, for me, air cargo and logistics was was always was always the interesting part. I think, I think you need to be resilient. That would definitely be one of the words I would use. I mean, the industry has definitely been through its crisis moments, not only in the past. Um, you know, three to four years, but but also before, uh, whether that was the financial crisis in 2008, um, you know, and and uh, and times before that. So, I, th I think you have to be resilient. I think, I think aviation and air cargo in in particular, it, what I would say is it really is what you make it, and the opportunity that you have is absolutely sensational. If you want to work in different areas of the world, if you want to work within different companies that specialize in different areas whether that's pharmaceuticals or live animals or you know you want to specialize in safety and security or you want to special you want to specialize in the commercial side the opportunities are absolutely endless and if you are somebody who has that drive that commitment that determination you know to coin an English phrase, the world is your oyster. It, it really, really is. And, and provided that you're able to be that open-minded and that flexible, um, you know, you can, you can. The opportunities are really, really limitless. Now, now that's not for everybody, of course. Some people are very happy, you know, to to stay in their home country, you know, for the majority of their lives and have and have their career, and that's absolutely fine too, because you need that mix of people. You always do. Um, but if you if you want the opportunity, it's it's certainly there. So definitely to be resilient, to be open minded, to be very, very hard working. You know, this industry is not Monday to Friday, nine till five. And if that's what you think you're coming into, then then you're mistaken. Um, and, and the higher you go up, you know, in an organization, then obviously the more demanding it becomes. And, and uh, you know, you need to be prepared for, for some weekend work as well. At the end of the day, particularly in operational roles, um, operations is running, you know, 24, seven, three, six, five. And, um, you know, we saw that with the pandemic as well, frontline staff as, as we would call them, you know, going to work every day to, to, to keep the global supply chain running. Yeah. And I think, you know, if, is it fair to say that if you're not ready for that, it could be a bit of a shock up kind of coming to aviation and seeing how much it demands from you. Cause I think a lot of people when they kind of perceive aviation as an industry, they think that, yeah, it's just a lot of traveling and, you know, a lot of planes and uh, suitcases, I guess. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think, I think perception is a, is a very interesting thing with the industry. You know, I've had, I've had conversations throughout the years, you know, with my friends who are perhaps in, you know, a financial role or a medical role or, you know, whatever they you know, whatever industry they're in. You know, and you sit together at certain times of the year to catch up and say, oh, how are things? Oh, it's fine. I was in Hong Kong last week for a meeting. I'll go to San Francisco next week. Oh, this must be so nice traveling the world. Well, let me tell you, it's exhausting. And generally you fly in um, on, a, on an overnight flight. You go straight into the meeting room. You maybe have a sleep and a shower and then you fly out the next day. You stay only at the airport. You sometimes don't even go to the city of where, of where you are but of course it sounds great doesn't it you know you've been to hong kong well the reality is is sometimes different of course it's it is pleasurable on 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 many occasions if you're going to the various industry conferences um to see you know all of uh, all of the people that you've met and, and grown with over the years 
um, you know, of course, it, it has its great sides as well. You know, please don't get me wrong, but um, it's it's sometimes it's a, it's exhausting. It, it is exhausting. I think this is something you, you definitely need to sign up for when you join the industry. And, um, you know, you just need to to be, as I said, resilient. And uh, yeah, but traveling is a wonderful thing and, and having that experience even if it's just for a few hours at a certain location, it's definitely worth it to fly to the other side of the world from my perspective. Mm. And now that the world is moving into the virtual uh, you know, reality and the even e-learning is now providing an opportunity for people to understand what aviation could bring to their life you know, just before they join, let's say. And that's what we do at our class because we want the people to understand you know, what's waiting for them out there in air cargo in your case. Um, but I want to know if you think that there's still something missing in the current supply of e-learning for aviation specialists. Well, I think the whole e-learning piece has, has certainly developed since the pandemic started. Um, you know, we were all thrown into this virtual world very, very quickly. Businesses had to keep running because employees were not sitting inside, you know, company facility anymore and things had to keep running. And I think very quickly companies realized that certain things can still happen to a very, very good level, um, you know, provided the people are dedicated, committed, and they, you know, they do what they say they're going to do. From a, from a learning piece, I think it's, I think it's a fine balance dependent upon topic. I think there are certain things which, which definitely need to be classroom based. I think there is definitely being the opportunity to bring more subjects to more of an e-learning. Um, so e-learning definitely provides the individual with that with that flexibility that they can study at their own time, or there's a virtual class that they can attend, so they can do that, you know, within their within the, their own home um, at a time that, you know that suits their their schedule. So. Dependent upon the topic, I think in terms of raising awareness, I mean, one of the courses we've just done together is the introduction into air cargo, where we've tried to highlight to the general public and to, to people who want to come into the industry, you know, what air cargo is about. And I think this is something that we can certainly always do on, a, on an e-learning environment. And then perhaps the more specific topics would be a combination of e-learning, a virtual class and perhaps face-to-face -face instruction. So I think I think we've learned a lot and I think e-learning is definitely here to stay, which I think is a very good thing because I think the outreach to the people will, will definitely increase. Uh, we can do that at a much lower cost for the individual rather than them flying somewhere, hotels, you know, and, and everything else. This definitely really, really has its, uh, has its advantage. Um, my own personal view again is, is I think it's a balanced approach and um, if you can build the balance between in-person, virtual, e-learning, then I think you have the, the optimum solution. But we also need to be able to tailor to those needs of the clients that require the training as well. Um, so be able to run topics on e-learning, run topics in a virtual class and run topics in a, in a classroom-led physical environment, you know, dependent upon the client. And I think that you know, this is definitely something that um, you know companies will be will be looking for uh, moving forward. And what about yourself as an instructor? How do you find this e-learning concept? Because instead of kind of standing in front of an audience, you stand in front of a camera. So how does that affect your style, your kind of delivery, and all that? Yeah, it's definitely it definitely brings its uh, it brings its challenges. I, I would still say my my preference is uh, classroom led training because I think the interaction with the people on a on a physical and a, you know from a dynamic perspective is definitely better. I think the learning experience um, is you know is definitely different from from an e learning perspective. The biggest challenge is engagement. So how, how to keep the people engaged, how to keep the people interested. You know, we know, I mean, there are various statistics out there that say what's, what's the maximum attention span when I'm sitting listening to somebody talking. Well, if I'm doing that in a virtual environment or I'm doing it in a, in a real classroom environment, it's definitely less in the virtual world. People get distracted. So how are we able to deliver the message, for example, in 20 minute slots, then having a break, doing engagement, uh, doing quizzes throughout the course, you know, to keep the people or to keep the students, um, you know, attentive is 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 definitely is definitely a challenge. I think 
I think there are advantages with it. I think you're able to to understand a little bit more from from the people um, in the case that you know they're they're struggling with something. They would perhaps you know send you a private message rather than asking in front of the group. You know, I've had I've definitely had cases of that. Um, you know, where people have approached me either via email or even during the class itself. Said, "Oh, I'm really struggling with this. You know, can you help me?" And perhaps in a group face to face, people perhaps be a little a little bit more shy. So I think that's definitely um, you know an advantage. But I'm a big advocate of of face to face. Um, but again, I think it's um, I think the the e learning is definitely you know here to stay, and we just need to find ways to to make the material as as engaging as possible. Because uh, the way I was thinking, uh, looking at all the courses, especially the ones that focus on you know, airport activities, whether it's, you know, from air cargo side or things from passenger, because I think, you know, it's easier to bring a camera and just you and stand in front of a camera in the airport and kind of explain things than to bring a whole group of people, you know, to the airport for them to see. Could that be something, you know, to look forward in the future for your learning, where you kind of get those lectures from, you know, inside the airport, for example? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that would certainly help to increase the attentiveness, I think, of the people and the and the reality of the environment in which you're talking, you know, is, uh, you know, I think is is definitely good. When we were preparing uh, the webinar, which we just did, I gave a short promotional video. I was standing at an airport outside on the on a cargo ramp, you know, wearing the safety uh, the safety visibility vest. And obviously this brings reality into the topic. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just talking now on a screen. We could be anywhere in the world and we're, we're talking about air cargo, but you know, we're not really in an air cargo environment. So definitely having that is, is good. I still believe in the example you gave, I think for the people, they would get perhaps a, a different benefit if they were there physically in the airport because then you hear things you smell things you you know you get that real overall view but in terms of reaching more people then obviously the virtual and the e-learning world is 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 definitely the way to go in terms of outreach and making it as as interactive as possible is you know is definitely uh, uh is definitely important so James, can you then tell our viewers about your course at our class? Just a quick run about what it is for, uh, who should benefit from, the, from it the most, and any other details you think they might find interesting. Sure. So we did a we did just a general a real general introduction into air cargo for for people who are perhaps studying and and, and want to understand a little bit more about the insides of air cargo. Um, and also for the general public, actually, you know, people who are just want to learn a little bit more about air cargo and the supply chain. Because I think air cargo throughout the pandemic has, in my perspective, quite rightly, you know, risen in, in terms of profile, both within the general public and also within airlines themselves. And air cargo is now finally getting the respect that it should have had many, many years ago, but I'm maybe a bit biased. Um, so we just talk about the general, you know, the general overview in terms of uh, trade lanes, in terms of commodities. We do a day in the life of a shipment uh, from Germany to New Zealand. Uh, we talk about the various documentation which is required. We have a deeper dive into the so-called express integrators. So um, looking at DHL Express in particular and their model and how their model fits into air cargo. We talk about e-commerce. Uh, we talk about data, which is associated within it. And we talk about the various jargon, which is in the air cargo industry. So the various abbreviations, and what they mean and where they where they fit in. So it is it is a brief introduction. Um, I think if you're looking for that for that taster into into what air cargo is, then it's definitely a course for you. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So let's move then to the air cargo side a bit more. Um, you mentioned yourself that uh, we had a webinar uh, about air cargo and you and other experts spoke about how um, air cargo is the industry hero, especially, you know, given those last two, three years that we had. But are there any particular lessons that were learned in this time? Yes, there are. I mean, I think air cargo is definitely, as, as we talked about before, resilient. 
Um, it's it's been there before. It's been through a crisis. It's come out of a crisis. You know, there is a cycle running somehow with this. Um, so I think we learned again that, that the resilience level is definitely there. We, we learned that our people who are working in these organizations, particularly on the front line, you know, are committed to the cause. They are definitely resilient. They definitely want to support, you know, this, uh, this wonderful industry. And the pandemic in particular was definitely a, an accelerator for air cargo in terms of digitization and transformation. You know, we, we as humans want to have less touch points, um, you know, physical touch points in, in the processes that we do or what we engage in outside of our homes, and that includes air cargo. So how am I able to, to deliver a piece of cargo without having to hand over a piece of paper, for example, or supporting documentation? How can I get everything in a digitized form? And there's been various programs running across the industry for many years, um, but I think the pandemic definitely um, you know, provided an, an opportunity for for acceleration, um, and and that you know another lessons learned in, in terms of opportunity. So the flexibility. If you're an airline, for example, a cargo airline that has uh, charter capacity, to have that flexibility to be able to move and go wherever you need to, you know, in a very very short amount of time, and and also contingency planning. So how do we plan for such events coming up i think that was definitely an element of that with organizations um it was definitely a surprise you know that all of a sudden from one day to the next we weren't allowed to have people inside inside the company so how can we manage our business outside how can we become um more sustainable i mean it's just, we talk about sustainability obviously from an environmental perspective that's the that's the key driver at the moment um, and, and that's still definitely within focus as well as business sustainability itself. So how can, how is my company able to, to survive and go through, you know, a pandemic? But overall, I think, you know, the industry has, has proved yet again, it's not, it's, I mean, it's worth, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's resilience, it's, it's structure, it's wanting to do the right thing, the effort, um, you know, and, I'm, and I feel personally extremely proud to be involved in this industry and, and to have played a, you know, perhaps a, a small piece, um, you know, in that throughout the last years. And um, definitely Air Cargo is for life and I'm pretty much sure I'll be in this industry. I mean, never say never, of course, but I'm pretty much sure I'll be in this industry until I retire. <laughs> so it sounds all very optimistic and obviously that's great yeah. but there were there anything that really made you think that oh this actually needs to be improved because we might struggle in the future with this no i think i think as i alluded to before you know data transformation getting into more real time operational movements when it comes to data i think we need to focus more on you know, on sustainability, this is definitely on, on one of the main agenda points of, of, of all companies at the moment. You see all the sustainability drives going on, whether that's ground service equipment, which are becoming more and more electric, whether that's sustainable aviation fuel, um, you know, with airlines and freight forwarders doing their various partnerships we've seen in the media recently. Um, you know, so these are definitely, definitely focus areas. I think also how to provide that consistent quality of service what we saw with the with the ukraine crisis and the and the sanctions with with russia um you know russia's main cargo airline airbridge cargo was more or less grounded from one day to the next well if i'm a ground handling company that's handling those those volumes through my warehouse that all of a sudden aren't there anymore then that obviously leaves a big hole so i think the demand and the the competition for business uh, has definitely increased um, so from my perspective, it's really all about maintaining that consistency and quality of operation, making sure my people are trained, making sure my people have the right tools and equipment, whether that's workwear, whether that's IT, whether that's the various infrastructure pieces. So, and this is, you know, this is a constant, uh, a constant, uh, a constant battle really, or a constant challenge, I would say, but I think the focus is perhaps more there now than you know ever it, uh, it has been uh, before but but there are definite opportunities the opportunities will will certainly be there airlines are ordering freighter aircraft i think as we also discussed in the webinar the focus 
on freighter only aircraft so cargo only aircraft will definitely emphasize in the future um, because we know that obviously the grounding of passenger aircraft uh, has a has a huge impact um, uh, not only from a capacity but also from a network perspective so these are definitely things which from a strategic perspective i think a lot of organizations will be focusing on as an opportunity in the future and what about sustainability then obviously it's a big talking point as well and you as an air uh, cargo guru what do you think the future holds for for this industry in terms of sustainability well sustainability as i mentioned before is is definitely on a on a high level in you know in many organizations and and, and this is also linked to government targets and challenges as well and you know companies have to have to work very very hard on this and, and, and some are i think that's perhaps it's important as perhaps slowed down a little bit since the pandemic and also the Ukraine crisis because sustainability, as I mentioned, is also about continuing to be able to do your business. Um, but sustainability is definitely an important point. So if I'm, for example, a ground handling company um, that's trying to get business from an airline, then I, I need to show various sustainable initiatives um, of, of how I'm, you know, making my business more sustainable, whether that's the equipment moving to more electronic, whether that's having solar panels on the top of my facility to provide energy. We're all aware of the current rise in energy prices, um, of course. So how can we become um, greener? And obviously, from an airline perspective, uh, you know, we talk about sustainable aviation fuel and so on. So it's, it's definitely an important topic. Um, sustainability, I think, as well, needs to be treated with the with the right balance and with the right, you know, the right approach to make sure that the the common sense approach, I would say, ultimately is the right way um, to go. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely here to stay. I see. And lastly, I want to talk about air cargo workers. So we spoke about the industry, you know, on its own, but. I wonder uh, what kind of training do these people have because, and you spoke about this on the webinar and obviously it's it's clear that air cargo also, you know, delivers needed supplies to danger zones to even, you know, let's say if there's like a huge earthquake and then, you know, the air cargo is the main source of food, I guess, and, 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 and medical supplies and all that. So what about, you know, danger zones? How do, how are they trained and what waits for those workers there? Well, first of all, I would say air cargo is a, is a very well uh, regulated industry when it comes to, to training focused on, on safety and security, obviously company procedures as well. So everybody working in, a, in an operational role requires um, security training, requires dangerous goods training. So when we talk about dangerous goods, not dangerous zones, but dangerous goods are, are commodities that are restricted uh, to, uh, to fly on an aircraft, which have to be handled and checked in a certain way. We need to be aware of these commodities that we're handling. So all personnel in operational roles have training on dangerous goods. Um, they all have training on security. So there are various you know, prerequisites dependent upon the area within air cargo, which you work, sorry, you work, your training would be you know, simply adapted um, accordingly. When you talk about disaster zones, I mean, this is quite, quite ad hoc. So more or less, you know, from a disaster recovery perspective, the focus is generally on uh, the airline themselves. So the flight crew and the people uh, preparing those flights for dispatch to go into those areas and, and looking at the infrastructure on the ground, which which they have. So, I think it is it is about training, and it is also in those in those particular disaster relief cases, it's definitely about um, experience, you know, as well. But um, training is is regarded extremely highly, uh, you know, within the industry. It's something which organisations must focus on because it is so heavily regulated. Um, by airlines, by civil aviation authorities. Um, so training is a is a critical component from an operational point of view. But then, how do we also keep the competence of our people at the right level? It's not just about attending a training course and you know saying yes, I've passed this course. Now I'm I'm good to go. The assessment of people in operational role is a is a constant job, and making sure that they are competent 
to be able to to work each and every day in an airport, in a ground handling facility, in a warehouse, uh, you know, handling aircraft. We need to make sure that the standards are are extremely high. And this again comes back to companies being sustainable in a highly competitive environment, having good people who are well trained to deliver. Um, you know the right service with the right knowledge of what of what they're handling. There are a lot of commodities within air cargo which require um, very very special handling. Yeah, whether that's dangerous goods, whether that's pharmaceuticals, whether that's live animals, perishable materials, um, and we have to be very very careful with these commodities. Um, and, and people must be trained accordingly. Thanks for that. Uh, so, just to end our conversation on a optimistic and inspiring note. Can you give our viewers three reasons why air cargo should be their next career stop? Interesting question to finish on. I'll maybe summarize a couple of the comments which which I gave earlier on. So so opportunity, th think global. If, if that's what you want, you know, think global. I would say no two days are the same. You, you see various things every single day, particularly in operational roles. That you would perhaps not see the day before or the day after, whether that's commodity based, shipment size based, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's a very, very, very interesting um, industry. So variety, I would say, you know, variety, um, opportunity and um, yeah, you really see such a valuable industry playing its part in in the global supply chain and and to be a part of that and to have the opportunity to um yeah to to provide your inputs into that i think is is a fantastic opportunity and it's it's really really global you can do it from anywhere in the world you can be involved in air cargo and logistics in in any country in any location you know all over the world if you if that's what you want um, then you should definitely do that. And I will always raise the flag and fly the flag for air cargo. I think it's the best side of the industry. It's the most exciting and dynamic side. And I think it's the, the side of the industry, which perhaps is the, is the unsung hero. And hopefully now because of the pandemic, we're getting more and more visibility into that, including the courses that we're doing together. And um, yeah, air cargo is the place to be. Just come over and let's, uh, let's start. That's a, such a wonderful way to end this conversation. I think we've got our title right here. Just come on over. It's amazing. <laughs> so thank you very much, James, for joining me. If you wish to learn with James, uh, go to aeroclass.org and check out his course. And uh, yeah, thanks again, James. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and hopefully we get to do this one more time and get into air cargo even deeper then. Very good. Thanks, Laura. Nice to see you. Talk to you soon. Bye then. Ciao.